in the early part of the 13th century. God spoke to Francis through a whole series of events from an encounter with a leper to a vision where God spoke to him directly and said, restore my church. Initially, he thought that meant to rebuild the ruins outside of Assisi. He had no idea at the beginning that he wasn't, he was starting a movement. And a movement that in fact did much to bring back into order the church. Like the Ezekiel reading, he knew that he was a part of a rebellious house. Still God's church, but certainly one that had strayed powerfully from the life and witness and teachings of Jesus. One of the earliest converts to the movement was Claire, the one who we remember today. Like Francis, a person who came from a wealthy family who was physically attractive, had in essence had the whole world in front of her in the prosperous village of Assisi, but was powerfully drawn by God to Francis's call to follow Christ which meant for Francis a renunciation of all of the power, all of the finances, and all of the privilege that had, given to, had been given to him as the son of a wealthy cloth merchant. Francis was radiant, and so was Claire. In fact, very, very quickly, a number of women began to follow after her, and what soon, like her, went from being an individual vocation of the start of the movement, the poor clairs, as they continue to call themselves to this day. And we in the Anglican communion have both Franciscans and clairs who practice their order within the context of this branch of Christ Church. I think about their example in, in a number of ways. One is, is that whether you or I may or may not call, be called to poverty, we are certainly called to trust Christ for provisions and not our bosses and not our employers. That in fact, he is the one who promises to provide for our needs according to his riches and glory. And no earthly power can do that. If we fall into the trap of somehow believing that we must kowtow to a particular line that our employer asks of us in a way that actually causes us to compromise the gospel, it is at that very point that we are straying powerfully from the call of Jesus in the gospel to trust him. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom because we follow one who is mightier and stronger than any earthly power or potentate. It is always the temptation of the church, specifically, to collude with power on the thought that somehow it might help them gain a voice among the powerful, not realizing that in terms of historical precedence, pretty much at every single point that that happens, the church more looks like the power they're trying to influence rather than the gospel of Christ. It is, in fact, an ever-present temptation, whether that be at the individual level or at the parish level or at the diocesan level or at the national church level and on and on it goes. Besides, we actually really enjoy our creature comforts. And it's an extraordinarily fine line to try to learn how to live in the world, but not of the world. In the world, rejoicing in the creation that God has made, like the hymn, this is my Father's world. And knowing that in the midst of that world, we, as Paul writes, wrestle not with flesh and blood. Perhaps one of the keys that would be helpful would be the call that marked both the Clares and the Franciscans, was that the prior was the priority that they gave to serve the poor as a way of helping them wrestle with what is what does it mean to live in the world but not of the world. It's a profound gospel value. 
Even in the starting of the Gentile mission, Paul writes in Galatians that after being examined about this new thing called ministering to Gentiles, the gospel of Christ, he, he writes these words. He says, When they saw that I, meaning Paul, and this has to do with the Jerusalem apostles, had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter making him an apostle also worked through me. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles. In other words, they're blessing their mission. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. In other words, any congregation, any Christian movement that so plays to a particular group of powerful in a way that actually sins, harms, or even forgets the preeminent ministry to the poor, is the one that is most likely to stray from the command to be in the world but not of the world. It's like insurance in a way. Because the more we serve them, get to know them, spend time with them, stand with them, see the world through their lens, it seems to me the more we get a better vision of what the world might look like in the kingdom of God and less like the values that most of us have inherited in this middle class Americans. And so Claire has much to say to us, to think about what does it mean to live a life where we, in essence, choose to live out a set of values that look like Jesus, but are profoundly contrary, even sometimes to the values of the church. God doesn't let us off the hook, even when the church strays. We can't blame the institution. Instead, the question is, Lord, in this day, what would you have me do? And out of that, follow after his commands. Amen. Amen.